Uh, all right, well, why don't we get things started? Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we've got a really exciting show uh, this evening. But first off, Matt Bullish will say a few introductory words. Good evening, everybody. How's it going? Welcome to the Film Society of Lincoln Center, to the Eleanor Buna Monroe Film Center, and to our as of yet unnamed amphitheater. Uh, my name is Matt Bullish. I uh, work with a uh, gentleman back there, Eugene Hernandez, uh, at the Film Society uh, on our Convergence program, which is focused towards immersive storytelling and talking about the, uh, the collision of the fine arts and technology and kind of where we're headed. And uh, we are always excited to welcome Story Code to the amphitheater. It's become kind of a regular fun thing and it's, it's always great. So again, uh, great to see so many new people here and also to see a bunch of people that have become kind of old friends now, old Story Code friends. Uh, we've had a lot of news at the, in the Film Society uh, recently. Um, we're coming up on the 50th edition of the New York Film Festival. Uh, it is the second oldest, as I understand it, film festival in the United States. Uh, and um, it's a very big time for us. Um, to get to 50 years is massive. And while we'll be doing a lot of programming that looks at the history of not just the festival, but of film, and the amazing people who have walked through these, not these doors, but the doors of Alice Tully and all of our other venues, um, Convergence has been tasked with looking forward again and kind of looking at the way that uh, storytelling is changing. Now, I've had the opportunity, as a lot of you have, uh, to go to a bunch of conferences and panel discussions and whatever else about transmedia, about immersive storytelling, and we thought we owed it to our audience to do something a little bit different. So Convergence is actually designed to be an intimate gathering. Um, we will be taking over the entire film center for the first weekend of the New York Film Festival. The only way to guarantee your seat at the table is to buy a Convergence Pass. There are not, there's a very limited amount of those. Um, it basically fills out all of our spaces and that's the way it works. Um, you can buy that pass right now if you go to filmlink.com and uh, you can check that out and, uh, and all the information about that. And we will be announcing pretty much the entire schedule and the entire lineup. Uh, in the next uh, couple of days. So you'll be able to very quickly see the kind of programming that we're going to bring you. Now, the programming, just to really quickly you know, get into that and then we'll you know, bounce it over to these guys uh, and get on with the, the main event tonight, uh, will be three different kind of tracks. There's the panels and workshops that people are kind of used to seeing. We're trying to do something a little bit different with them, be a little bit more incisive, a little bit more, you know, granular, really get down into details. These workshops and panels were designed for and by creators of transmedia. There's not going to be a broad kind of analysis of how stories are different. We're not going to get into that. We're not going to talk about the dark word gamification. <laughs> we will not mention monetization unless it's like in cursing. So uh, it should be a really interesting thing. But the big thing that we're the most excited about is that Convergence at NYFF will offer no less than four, and possibly even more, actual experiences that our attendees will get to interact with. Those range from live kind of audience participation or whatever uh, to, to a giant video game, 100 people play at the same time in a movie theater. All of these details will be available in the next couple of days. I encourage you to look at filmlink.com. Look for us, look for on our Twitter feed for, you know, convergence and all that other jazz. And if you have any questions whatsoever, sorry, I'm like stuttering here, uh, any questions about NYFF Convergence, please feel free to track me down after the show or send me an email, uh, mattbullish at filmlink.com. I would be happy to answer them. Um, this is designed for you guys, and we hope that you all join us for it and make it a real big success. So again, without any further ado, I will bounce it back over to Ion and Mike. Welcome Story Code. Thanks for coming. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Matt. Hi guys, welcome uh, to our August forum. And thank you for uh, you guys who came out to our summer social. We're gonna try to do those twice a year um, and um, you know, keep the party going so we have an opportunity to meet each other outside of these forums. So, very excited about today. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag, hashtag story code. And if you're not following us, follow us at at storycode.org. And um, if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, go to the website and subscribe. We always post the greatest and the latest and the greatest in the world of uh, cross media, immersive media, and transmedia uh, once a month. So thank you all for coming. And uh, oh, I'm Ina. 
one of the co-founders of StoryCode, and this is Mike. And I'm Mike. The other guy. Um, so, <laughs> the other guy. Uh, how do I follow that? Um, well, uh, er, you know, thanks again for everyone coming. We're really excited to welcome Jesse Redness uh, from USA Network. Uh, we've, we reached out to Jesse because he's really a trailblazer um, on several fronts. The projects that USA has done and, and that Jesse's led have really been uh, inspirational, and we're really excited to learn about them. So uh, with that, we'll welcome um, Jesse Redness, the SVP of Digital at the USA Network. Welcome. Make sure this thing's still on. There we go. So before I started, uh, I brought with us um, the actual Bible that USA Network follows while we're creating these types of experiences. 40 pages deep. Uh, it's kind of our playbook. And I actually wanted to read you guys the title. Three-day potty training. Start Friday, done Sunday. The queen of potty training will share tips, advice, and secrets to potty training in only three days. Needless to say, there absolutely is no manual to doing what we do now. Um, I think everybody in this room knows that uh, what's happening in the space, uh, especially with, with the major media companies and this convergence space, um, is that uh, there's, there's really no Bible. There's no rules. Um, as we kind of get into some of the things we wanted to share today, um, I think the best way to really talk about and start uh, sharing some of these stories is to tell the story about how one of them actually was born. Um, the story of Hashtag Killer, uh, which I think is probably one of the crown jewels that we have uh, for the USA Digital Network and the USA Digital team as a whole, um, really came about in 2011 out of South by Southwest. Um, one of the stars, Dulé Hill, uh, was really new uh, to Twitter. Uh, he literally joined about four days before the event. Uh, and immediately he was already up to, you know, 25, 30,000 followers just because, you know, he's Dulé Hill, he's on the West Wing, and he's Gus and Psych. Um, so we're on the panel at South by Southwest. Um, myself, uh, Jen Cavanaugh from Oxygen, Steve Franks, who is the writer and producer of, of, uh, of Psych, and Dulé. And Dulé uh, wanted to do something that really got people in the audience uh, to react. Um, and he was really... Uh, exploding on Twitter and exploding on a way where he literally had like finger diarrhea. When there's like verbal diarrhea, he had finger and hashtag diarrhea. He was just like on it all the time, hashtagging everything and its mom. Um, so we're sitting in there halfway through the panel. Dulé goes, well, what can I do? And I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you have somebody in the crowd tweet something? And this is, we're kind of leaning back and we're on the panel. There's two big screens up next to us with the back channel, the Twitter back channel going with the hashtag for our room. Um, and all of a sudden, Dulé tweeted something. And uh, I'm in the middle of, of describing one of the new mobile platforms we had launched. And some girl in the front row or a couple rows back jumps up and starts screaming. And, uh, and I'm like, what the? And Dulé just starts cracking up. Um, little did I know is that Dulé actually uh, tweeted out, if anybody is here in the room, anytime Jesse opens his mouth, yell up and start screaming. Um, so, uh, so for Dulé, you know, it was that, that kind of crossover moment for him where the, the Twitter universe, uh, the digital world crossed over into something that he could see, something tangible in which one of these followers, somebody that was reading something he was saying, was right there in his face and reacted in the, in the human sense with their body, jumping up and yelling and screaming, um, getting that kind of emotional response. Um, after that, um, we're drinking beers, of course, and eating barbecue, because that's what you do at South by Southwest, uh, and then put some meetings in there. Um, we're, we're just talking about stuff and started talking about ideas on what to do next. Um, Dulé goes off and goes back up to Vancouver. Fast forward a couple days, it's a Saturday night, and Dulé Hill tweets out a picture of himself uh, dressed as a vampire killer. And uh, he goes, hashtag vampire killer. Myself, Jen Kavanaugh, who, were, who was on the panel as well, start tweeting back and forth. And we're like, dude, you need to cool it with the hashtags or we're just going to start calling you hashtag killer. Right then and there, the three of us started saying, oh, my God, this is a really cool idea. And Dulé was like, oh, my God, look out, there's the hashtag killer. And uh, we were like, we need to take this off Twitter immediately because the fans, all 40,000 of your fans, are going to pick up on this really quickly. Uh, and the idea is going to be bust before we even launch it. 
Um, that night, we kind of drafted up an idea, brought it in. At that same time, granted, we're in the middle of March, you know, end of March, beginning of April, we're in the middle of developing our first offering using the Social Samba platform. So we were in the middle of developing with 30 Ninjas here, who are going to be sharing this presentation when I'm done babbling, um, uh, of doing the TweetCast, the uh, Covert Affairs Mission Budapest TweetCast. And we were like, huh, I wonder if you could do this with your platform or this with your platform. And we got to a point where we started just bolting on every what if. Um, and we started to really take this idea from a seed of three people on Twitter out to a massive team of people bringing ideas onto the table, um, all of which spread out across the entire company. Uh, and that kind of gets me to my point in which um, at USA, I think that the, the network itself now is, is becoming a lot more horizontally aligned uh, in which social di digital connection really revolves around bringing people back to the programming. Uh, Characters Welcome Network also doesn't really hurt uh, what we're trying to do, uh, but bringing that human element into our creative process uh, really came to life when we launched Mission Budapest Tweetcast, when we launched Hashtag Killer, and saw half a million people come into the storytelling rather than receiving the storytelling. Um, and it's a huge team effort that extends beyond just the digital and social teams. Uh, 30 Ninjas playing a huge component of that. Five other digital development firms, game developers, um, bunch ball uh, gamification platform providers and affinity platforms, um, and as well as the on-air team, the marketing team, all the way up to the presidents of the company are behind this. Um, so without further ado, I want to actually kind of share um, the uh, hashtag killer reel which is the reel we submitted for the Interactive Emmys. Uh, very proud of the fact that we were nominated for an Interactive wow. Emmy. Thank you very much. And, uh, and fingers, fingers crossed, um, we find out in a couple weeks. Um, but this is literally what Hashtag Killer uh, looks like and felt like. Obviously, you can't experience it unless you went in and played. Here we go. This is the story of Psych Hashtag Killer. In 2011, USA wanted to extend their storytelling capabilities beyond the boundaries of a finite season. They reached out to and activated the massive, socially connected psycho fan base by launching a true multi-platform immersive experience, Hashtag Killer. USA's goal was to leverage the social platforms to amplify the buzz surrounding the show and drive more brand awareness and increase viewership. Hashtag Killer launched, leading into a real-world event, USA Psych Fan Appreciation Day. Fan Appreciation Day was the bridge that activated fans in the real world to enter the interactive murder mystery in the social world. Hashtag killer sounds like a crazy person. Hashtag Killer is a first-of-its-kind real-time digital storytelling experience that combines the best of transmedia, gamification, and social media to create unique story experiences with the user. To solve the case of the Hashtag Killer, fans were tasked with using multiple platforms and social outlets to gather clues and play a key role in the story. We worked directly with Sykes writers and producers to create over 30 minutes of exclusive video footage shot on their set with the cast and crew. Oh, look at that. The experience began with a custom video featuring Sean and Gus as they set up the Psych Agency's Facebook page and Twitter feed. It was high time I joined the 20th century. It's the 21st century, Sean. Instantly, the agency received a cryptic tweet from the hashtag killer to pique the interest of our psychic social detective fans. And the mystery began. Within hours of its launch, hashtag killer was trending on Twitter. Psych fans were on the case. In a simulated real-time experience, fans became immersed in the game's world, clamoring for the next piece of the HTK puzzle and sharing with their friends as bits of the story were released throughout the day, seven days a week for seven weeks. They were led through this world through photos, games, and exclusive audio and video content featuring the stars of Psych. Fans sent messages to their favorite characters and got instant, real-time responses, becoming integral characters in the mystery. They shared their favorite lines on their Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus accounts directly from the experience, acting as the catalyst for the social amplification. Facebook Connect and Social Samba platform technology personalized the experience to create a unique story for every user. That's over 400,000 stories being told. Interactive crime scenes tested users' investigative skills. Bonus minigames could be unlocked for extended gameplay. All the while, gamification strategies kept our fans engaged while they were incentivized to rack up points in our affinity program, Club Psych, climbing the leaderboard to win a coveted starring role as one of the hashtag killer's victims. And now he's gonna kill Ken. For nearly two months, 24-7, Hashtag Killer became an ongoing part of our psychos' everyday lives and made social history, and the ratings went through the roof. 
USA. Likes welcome, tweets welcome, hashtag killers welcome, stories welcome, characters welcome. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, so, so what we want to do is, uh, is bring up the team from 30 Ninjas, uh, Juliana and Max, to actually talk about you know, the process in which we go through to create something like that, um, as well as to have a couple little surprises, um, which is going to show you some of the real-time nature of how this really kind of unfolded. Um, so guys want to join me? Yeah. <coughs> I think that works. <laughs> Hi, I'm Max Sodaldi. I was the um, the writer for the text portion of the project, which I think you guys so got sort of an idea. Was there's a lot of lot of information out there, um, but a big part of what I focused on was the other than the writing for Sean and Gus in the text portion was the integration of the fan experience. Um, and so I thought to help you all get sort of a a notion of what that's like, I wrote an interactive hashtag mini hashtag killer Minnesota for you guys that we'll hopefully experience at the end. I think it should, it should work. We believe um, it will. So, <laughs> exactly. You may be asking yourself, how can I possibly get involved in this amazing interactive experience? But if you tweet at the, the I think it's hashtag store code, is that? That sounds right. Um, ha tweet there and I will be writing you into the, into the story which will air right at the end. Um, so the truth is that the hashtag killer has already been here. So if you by any chance find a clue, possibly marked with a hashtag around the area. You're sitting in that. a crime scene right now. Feel free to the hashtag killer has, has struck. Feel free to tweet that at the story. Um, so yes, um, you, are, you guys are currently in story right now. And scene. Yes. Go. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. But one thing that the Emmy reel didn't really it's, it's not particularly visual, but the way that the matrix of the story was that it was told through text and that you were cast, you as individuals, one to game, or cast as Sean and Gus's new assistant. And so the social samba platform has a call and response, has a pretty rudimentary AI keyword-based um, system where we as writers can write in questions and expect an answer. And we worked very closely with Social Samba so that to tweak it so that we could write 20 potential answers and have really very specific conversations with single fans. At the same time that you could then have this one to game experience, there was a live run and a real time element to it because it ran for seven weeks, five days a week actually, not seven days a week. We depends rested. On which day you play, I guess, right? Well, it does depend on which day you play because it's real time. Every day would unlock in real time. So we were, I'll put a pin in that because then you're dealing with a couple of different layers of time as storytellers. Um, but we had a live run where if you tweeted to Sean and Gus, and if you t or if you tweeted to us, or you tweeted something really funny, we would have Sean and Gus pick up on it, and we would write you into the game live. And then the top people, the top fans on the leaderboard, we actually wrote in as victims every week. So there was a competition within the fans to have these conversations over social media that, sh that Max and I would scour and spend hours. We were on Twitter. I, I swear to God, I don't think I saw my fam. I mean, there wasn't a baseball game with my son that I wasn't on Hootsuite going, oh, that's a good one. That's, oh, and then sending it to Max and write that one in. So there, the, the game was, the, the story is so engaging because we lived it with you, essentially, as writers, um, while all the time hanging off the skeleton of the story which the TV show actually created from, from this initial idea. So we worked very cl closely and collaboratively with the, the, the TV show, which I have to say Jesse and his team do an amazing job of getting all of these people from different companies and different creatives to get together and believe in it and collaborate when by nature there, there's a fair number of people in TV who are like, my show, my show, my show, my show. It's my show. 
That's my show. And the USA people generally aren't that way. And I think that that's a, that, I mean, you, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that's evolved. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's key to what our process it, it is. is. I, I think that, um, can everybody hear me? No. All right, cool. I don't think I need a mic. I'm all good. I'm all good. Um, I, I think the entire process, and it, we're seeing it a lot at USA, is that the storytelling process um, is, is shifting a bit. And the shows, and it really rooted in Psych being one of the early adopters of digital, of social, as one of the core elements of how they continue telling their story. All of our show writers and producers are basically on board with this process now. I, don't, I, I really don't think that we have a single show writer or producer in our stable uh, that is telling us, literally, fuck off, don't mess with my show. Excuse my French, but I like to swear. Um, and uh, and it, it just doesn't happen that way. I, I think that they see the power of what's happening with social influence, with where you can actually connect with fans. And at the end of the day, a show is only as successful as the people tuning into it. Um, and, and yes, there are some dark words like monetization uh, that nobody wants to mention, but you know, those are the things that are, are helping us to continue uh, creating things. Um, so we want to be able to, yes, monetize them, but we can't monetize unless we've got audience. Um, so a as precious as these paintings are that all of our showrunners and producers and our talent are painting, uh, the canvas is getting a lot bigger. Uh, and participation from audiences is starting to basically color on the outsides of it. Um, with Hashtag Cure, I think what we really did is had the show writers and producers give us a, a watercolor black and white with numbers in which all of our fans can start pulling in the colors into these little areas within the overall picture. And that was a big aha moment for them. I mean, one of the stats that we showed up on the screen was the fact that the ratings went up in this season of Psych that we launched Hashtag Killer. It was its sixth season. So to have a show in its sixth season with ratings going up is almost unheard of. To have them go up in the 18 and 34 demographic, 25, 54 demographic by, I think it was about 10%, um, this hashtag killer campaign, a lot of the big promotions that we did all coalesced together to have that influence, but that influence is there. It happened because the fans love the show. They are super passionate about the show. And the psych writers and producers now, I mean, it was the only way we marketed the show aside from our own air for that season. So it was hashtag killer, fan appreciation day, in our own air. That's it. Um, and the show increased viewership. Um, so I, I think when we tell that story and showcase all the things we've been doing at USA to all of our other shows, um, we literally numerous times a quarter go out to LA and up to Canada to roadshow all of these things to all the writers and producers of our shows. Um, great things happen in which we get Jeff Easton from White Collar in a battle with Matt Nix from Burn Notice trying to outdo each other by, I'm gonna have the most Twitter followers or fans on Facebook. Um, they try to do as many cool interactive hooks into uh, their shows as they possibly can just to be fun and funny and have a little rivalry going even though they love each other. Um, it, it's gotten to the point where they're coming to us saying, hey, what's something really cool and different that we can do to keep on telling our stories? And when you've got a television producer and writer coming to the digital and social team saying, how can we keep telling our stories with you? You know there's something really cool going on. Um, now, it's not to say that what we're doing can't be done off of a network because we're seeing it all the time. Um, one of the examples I actually was just talking about with the team here was something I saw, actually I got targeted on Facebook by Intel, uh, a project called Beauty Inside. Um, and it's a very cool looking project. Um, I think just the very first piece of it released on August 16th, here I'm shilling for an Intel project, it's really cool. Uh, it stars, uh, I think, Topher Grace and, and some other players, but you know, when they launched the project and I was reading through uh, basically a lot of the streams and, and background about it, they focused everything on it being about you, pulling you into the experience. And I think that's what was so special about Hashtag Killer. As Julina was kind of mentioning, it brings you into the storytelling and you are now invested in where the story goes. Uh, and people were literally living it 24 seven, as much as we were writing, but for five to seven days a week. Um, and they were consuming it in the same way that Julie and I would text each other on a Monday back and forth a couple of times. That's how pieces of information are shared in the real world and that's how we created this universe in Hashtag Killer. To give you an idea, you spent the day, you spend the day with Sean and Gus. So they'll be, they'll, they'll text in the morning, two hours later there'll, there'll be another scene that's maybe five minutes long. 
Then there's another scene three hours later. And so you'd have to keep coming back. And you were literally spending the day with Sean and Gus. And the fans do this. I mean, the psych fans, They're the psychos. really sweet thing about the thing we're so lucky about, and we've done a lot of these projects now uh, in terms of the covert, covert affairs, suits, and, and hashtag, and psych, to have a fan base that's willing and, and knows your characters is a complete rush. That you don't have to win them over because TV's done that already. Mm -hmm. So as, as storytellers, for us, it's slightly cheating because we're not building the characters from scratch. But it's really fun to interact because they're, just, they're so eager to eat it all up. So we launched Hashtag Killer two weeks before the premiere. That was all the psych they were going to get. So they were there every single day. Yeah. And also sending us angry tweets of like, when are Sean and Gus coming back? I've been waiting for two hours. Well, not just that, um, but what's great about it is that real fans, the people that are in this experience, were our QA. They were the oh. ones who were actually QAing this entire platform for us because we literally yeah. were bolting on. New that's ideas great on the for cloud. you as an executive. Hey, that's as the interactive producer, <laughs> that's less fun. I'm just Q live QA is. <laughs> Emotionally stressful. But I think that when, when, <laughs> that, <laughs> when you're doing something like this, there's no such is. thing as non-live QA. You can't put well, something like this in the wild without just putting it into the wild yeah. to see how people would react. And I think that's what the beauty of it was, was that you guys didn't sleep, but you guys made it so much better because you, you literally were listening to everything people were saying and writing the story in real time to what people were saying. And we did it, Jesse mentioned it, we did this uh, tweet cast, which was a spy story told over Twitter with a show called Covert Affairs prior to doing Hashtag Killer. And what we learned for that was that Twitter, as its own broadcast medium, is a little bit like just throwing your story away. Because if you miss it, you can't replay it. You can't get it back. So that what Social Samba is so great about is that the live run would start could start on a Tuesday. If you heard about it, next Wednesday, you could still start on day one, and eventually you would be able to catch up with the live run. But either way, you still get your own experience. You're not, you, it's that one to game element ended up being hugely important for the fans to be able to participate if you were two weeks late in the live run. Yeah. So, um, you know, hashtag obviously isn't the only project we've ever done. Uh, it's one we're, we're very proud of. Um, we are in the middle right now of, of doing one for suits called Suits Recruits, uh, using uh, the same team, uh, must, m most of the same team that worked on, on Hashtag Killer. Um, but before we got any further, I just wanted to be able to answer any quick questions of anything that's fresh yeah. in anybody's mind, because I want this to be fruitful for you guys uh, as much as possible. We've got a new property, so it's the premiere season. Um, generally, you wouldn't get a lot of money spent to go, no, got an audience yet. It's psychic. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the playbook is on the ground, and uh, we don't really use a playbook. Um, we actually have some members in the, in the crowd here who worked on a recent project from a brand new um, uh, TV show that we launched. Uh, we worked with Campfire uh, to launch um, a, a project around political animals. Uh, political animals was very tough for us because it was a completely new genre, uh, different type of writing, different type of characters, um, and we didn't know what to do. There was no installed user base uh, of fans here. Um, and we wanted to explore what's the best way to go about doing this. Uh, so part of our playbook is to reach out people to people that we've used in the past uh, and to start brainstorming. Um, the last thing we want to do is to say, here's your idea, and you're going to go do it. That's not what we're about. We're about reaching out to people that we know are creative, uh, that we know can think outside the box, uh, that we know have a great track record of, of prior projects that they've done. And we, we launched a phenomenal campaign with them five years ago called uh, the Promising Campaign for 40 for 100. Jeremiah's here uh, and worked on it. And uh, we wanted to get back in there and, and, uh, and talk to them about a, an idea. And so we launched um, the Washington Globe. Uh, it's more of an interactive, uh, I'd kind of call it um, um, Huffington Post specifically for um, political animals. So it was a very fictionalized Huffington Post. Um, and we, you know, they created a, a phenomenal world around uh, Washington, D.C. and the characters within political animals. Um, and that, you know, for us, it was amazing because we saw the passionate fans that are loving the show going deeper and deeper and deeper into the story. The, 
consuming more about these characters. And I think that's what, what we're creating uh, enables people to do, is to experience more about this story. Um, so, no, there really is no playbook. Um, we know that some things work really well. Um, and like I said, we took hashtag Kill Adam Suits coming into its second season. Um, doesn't have a fan base at Psychast. You know, Psych has two and a half million fans on Facebook and doing really, really well. Suits was the number one show last summer. I think it only has a little over a million fans on Facebook. A completely different type of storytelling. Uh, it's, you know, a law firm. And it's, it's, there's a lot of comedy within it, but it's very suspenseful. And, and, um, and Psych is a very different type of storytelling. But we use the same types of platform um, and uh, this, a similar type of outlook on how we want our fans to interact, and it's working extremely well. Um, to the tune of, uh, I was actually really surprised at how many fans came into Suits Recruits and uh, very pleasantly surprised, as is our, our partner that we brought into the experience, uh, Lexus. Um, and uh, speaking of monetization, these things are very expensive to do. Um, and so we have to find ways to create these pieces of content with our partners. Um, so rather than just slapping banners on things and doing you know, beauty shots with our car, we're taking an approach in which we want to create content with all of our partners. Uh, so we call it the created with approach. Um, so rather than sponsored by or brought to you by, it's created with these people. So I think uh, Intel Inside and what that represented back in the late 90s when everyone was like, it's got Intel Inside. Da -ding. Um, that's what we want to do with our brand partners. They look to us to, to tell the best stories and figure out ways that we can organically integrate them into that thread. passionate about do you see a future where fans are so passionate about the extra extra content that you're creating that they feel comfortable purchasing like a different price point have you seen any signs of that people saying like hey we, if we could get this we would pay x amount of dollars for it you, you know that's that's really interesting um i, I think that in, in some ways i think the entire uh ecosystem right now is, is experimenting that with that you know look at what's happening with kickstarter um basically doing a, a pay for Twitter service. Um, I think there may be a point in time where we get to a subscription or a you know, sign up with a, a nominal value and it'll unlock X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's, it's a really um, tough uh, business uh, proposition because you have to look at the aspect of you're trying to reach as many people as possible with your content um, and to limit the access to the content by saying, oh, you know what, you're not gonna be able to get to it unless you pay. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough decision to make. Um, and it ties all the way back to the whole decision on, you know, do we let people that don't have a cable subscription watch our show streaming online? Um, and all these battles were going on. Um, for us, we want as many people as possible to experience our brand. And our brand is growing beyond just the television show itself into the world of USA Network, into the world of storytelling and all our characters. Um, so it's, it's definitely not off the table. It's something we're thinking should we continue on? Or well, the more question? Or? Uh, yeah, my question is, how do you, how do you geekify your fan base? <laughs> if you look at the, the chatter that's happening on the show, <clears throat> what really impresses me is you have everything. You have the karate, you have <laughs> the board housewives, you have uh, you know, my father and brothers who are Um, thank you. Um, it's very, very tough, um, but at the core of it, it is, it's about the story. Um, and it's, you know, at the core of it, it's not just about the story, but it's about you, the human being. Uh, and for us, when we create content, um, you know, that's not the first thing we think about when we're creating content and creating how do we engage with our user base. It's everyone here in the room and understanding who each one of you are, uh, and then from there, backing out how do we create content from there. Each one of our shows has a completely different demographic that watches it. Um, all the content is very different. Um, and so the team, the marketing team, the digital team, the social teams, they dig deep to understand all the psychographics of all the different types of users. Um, now when you look across the entire kind of catalog of things that we're doing in the digital and social space and the social TV space and transmedia storytelling space, um, we experiment a lot. And sometimes they fall flat on their faces, sometimes they work really well. Um, and it's really tough right now to say what's a success and what's not because, you know, the marketplace is in its nascency and we don't really know what's going to happen. I, I do have another reel that I can, I can show that actually goes through a, a wide array of some of the things we're doing. Is anybody interested? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
um, and then we'll jump back into, into this stuff. Um, so this is uh, what we call our USA Social TV Reel. You're going to see a lot of familiar companies that are buzzing in the marketplace. Some of them are already gone, uh, which is kind of crazy, um, but some of them are still around. Uh, these are the partners that we work with outside of people like 30 Ninjas that are helping us get to where we are right now. Welcome to USA Social TV. At USA, we're not only the number one network, we're the leaders in social. We're the industry standard for the way people watch now, with innovations that help fans form deeper connections. We're first to market pioneers, placing the water cooler in the palm of our fans' hands. From real-time engagement to check-ins and reward systems rooted in gamification to the best in transmedia storytelling, we're constantly adding new layers of connection. It's kind of like a superpower. Here's how we do it. Character Chatter is USA's social water cooler, fostering fan-to-fan -fan conversation and the place to go one-on-one -on -one with show insiders and talent. As a home base for two-screen sync opportunities, it amplifies social buzz by funneling a real-time feed of text, images, and videos from all social streams. I think we got it all out, right? Our Anywhere app connects fans to USA, giving access to their favorite USA shows with a welcome social experience. When fans watch in real time, they're rewarded with exclusive content, badges, and access. And we're partnering with the leaders. At its best, social is about storytelling. And at USA, we're experts at developing immersive narratives in collaboration with show creators and their brand partners across multiple platforms and devices, integrating social levers throughout. Makes perfect sense. With a partner like DC Comics, we took social storytelling to a new level, bridging seasons with a dynamic, interactive graphic novel featuring the new Hyundai Veloster. Hashtag killer. Sounds like a crazy person. To help Sean and Gus solve the case of the hashtag killer, we put our fan at the center of it all as an integral character in this murder mystery social game. Fans were tasked with utilizing multiple platforms and social outlets. The results speak for themselves. 86 million social shares, over 400,000 unique visitors, 14 minutes average time spent. Let's change the game. With USA Social TV, we're inviting a two-way dialogue and deep engagement on every screen. We welcome your involvement. At USA, it's not brought to you by, it's created with. Together, we'll blaze new social trails. USA, likes welcome, tweets welcome, check-ins welcome, stories welcome, characters welcome. Um, yeah, so as you can tell, uh, we've got a, a phenomenal on-air creative team too that's putting together <laughs> awesome spots to tell our story. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but at the end of the day, like I said, it is uh, an entire team effort. Um, so. One of the newest projects that we have now out in the marketplace uh, is Suits Recruits. Um, Suits Recruits basically dovetails with this current season of Suits. Um, anybody here a, a viewer of Suits? The show is like super badass, one of the best shows on television right now. It finale is actually on Thursday. Here's my, my plug um, <laughs> at 10 o'clock on USA. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I said, with Suits Recruits, um, we didn't really know uh, whether or not this fan base was going to take to this type of um, immersive storytelling the same way that the hashtag killer crowd did. Um, and in the end, and we're coming up on the end of this overall program, uh, we're looking at some really phenomenal results. Um, to the tune of almost double the time of engagement that people in hashtag killer were spending. And I think what happens here is that we're learning. Um, as we're going and we're iterating on the different types of platforms we're putting out there. Um, and so when we look to that, um, you know, book playbook that we have uh, and look back, we're not actually running the same plays really anymore. What we're doing is we're adding moves, jukes to the left, uh, option out to the right, whatever it may be, to make it better, uh, to make sure that every single play we have, that we're, it's going to be a great experience for that particular fan. Um, so at the core of it, what we're trying to do is set up literally an infrastructure um, that is connecting all of our users together uh, so they become accustomed to participating in different types of social engagement, digital engagement, mobile engagement. Um, and, and really, at the end of the day, uh, social platforms are what's making it a two-way dialogue. Um, and that's what's really important and interesting to us. Um, you know, somebody on a call I had yesterday asked me the question, and this is a really uh, important question, and I, it, I, can, I, have, I have verbal diarrhea, and I actually stopped to think about it for a second before 
um, my partner in crime here, uh, Suzanne, kicked me under the table and just answered. Uh, she asked me, um, do you think you would have had as much success with Hashtag Killer if it didn't revolve around Psych and the characters from Psych? And I was stopped and I thought about it for a second. And I was like, you know what? There is no way that we would have seen that type of success with Hashtag Killer had we ignored Psych, the mythology, the characters, um, you know, the, the main picture that these, these team of people created over the course of six seasons um, and the fan base that they generated. Uh, there's no way we would have seen the success that we saw without that. Um, and I think that response uh, speaks volumes to why it was such a big success. Um, and I know that there's a lot of projects you have to do as Greenfield that don't have a huge network and huge fan bases behind it. Um, and the best story you can possibly say is um, I had 100 people participate in this. Um, and really, you know, for us, it's, it's figure out what your threshold is for success. Uh, it might not be a million people, it might not be half a million people, it could just be a hundred people. It could be one person that comes back to you and says, you know what, this changed the way I'm perceiving engaging with this show or this character or, or this piece of content online or in mobile or whatever it may be. Um, and that was kind of the really important lesson that we learned coming out of Hashtag and that we put into Suits. is like, we set our expectations really low and we were blown away. Um, so everybody set your expectations low. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add, the one thing about Suits that was different and I think really contributed is that I talked about telling the story in real time. What we did with Suits, actually, was that we incorporated the TV time. And so we wrote scenes that foreshadowed what would happen on TV. And so, and the day of the TV show, you were reading the texts of the Law Network that were going on the day of that, that day. And then we would continue and talk about what had just happened but as gossip, as, as characters, essentially, so that we wove the mythology of the live TV show into our story. So we had the level of the live run, the TV story time, and the real time going at one time. We also, we also bifurcated. Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. it, it, it really jazzed the audience, it did. the fans. Right, with, but we uh, also bifurcated the storytelling in which you oh, could yeah. choose which story you wanted to immerse yourself in. Uh, you know, Pearson Hardman is the law firm in Suits. Um, and it, to come into the experience, you had to choose whether or not you wanted to be a, a paralegal or an assistant. Um, and so literally the team here had to write two different stories and you get two different perspectives on what's happening within the story based on what role you play. Um, the main idea behind this was that we wanted the paralegals to go find assistants to partner up to get the complete picture. So it really was, um, you needed to go find somebody that was playing in real time with you to start collecting information and sharing that information. Um, and we created within the game an area that we called the water cooler. You know, you're at a law firm, the idea of the water cooler, now everyone's like, oh, the water cooler is Twitter, the water cooler is Facebook. We actually created in the game an area called the water cooler and tried to, you know, reimagine what it's like to be at the water cooler in the office. You know, nobody even does it anymore. Everyone's got water bottles in their own office and they never go to the water cooler. Um, but uh, we created a, a real-time stream in, that enabled fans to meet each other, uh, even if they're complete strangers, uh, match themselves up and start sharing information so that they can get to the next level. Um, and I think that was really important because that, uh, that brought in, again, a human element that showed teamwork. Um, and I think that speaks volumes to the community as well, is when we say, you know, characters welcome, we want it to be a community feeling. When you're, when you're on Twitter and you're tweeting about the scene you just watched, um, there's very little sense in some cases of the fact that there's a huge community of people that are feeling the same emotions you are or seeing the same scene, scenes you are with the same reactions. Uh, this is a way that we are able to bring them all together into one location uh, and work together towards a common goal. Um, so, I, Max, are we ready for some real-time storytelling? We are close. We're close. Yes, I'm, I'm uploading pictures and then we're good. All right. He's so an eternal maybe I answer tweaker. a couple more questions, and we'll get to some real-time storytelling. Uh, so you talked about uh, deciding on your measures of success. Yeah. It might be 100, it might be 1,000. Underwhelming, uh, you know, overperform, underwhelm uh, expectations. <laughs> um, how do you sell that within USA Network, a very <coughs> profit-oriented business? Um, you know, for, for us with Hashtag Killer, um, I think what we had to do is look at the body of work that we had created over the course of years to really say, 
you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't just a whim that this is going to work. This is a calculated um, strategic move uh, in which we know uh, that we've seen a lot of success using gamification strategies, using social TV strategies, using all these different things. Um, and when you actually have the show writers and producers coming on board and saying, this is awesome, we really like this, we want to make this happen, it's actually really tough to have our upper executives say, you know what, no, we don't want to do this. Um, especially when they're not supporting the show in any other way. Um, when you're trying to bring on advertisers or sponsors or partners into the fold, it's a completely different game. Um, so for us, we have to use our historical data, our historical stories to then sell them through. Um, so it's an education process. You know, Hashtag Killer didn't have an integrated advertiser or partner within it because it had never been done before. Um, and my wife actually runs an ad agency, a digital ad agency, and she's like, yeah, it's amazing, but it's going to be really hard for me to sell this into my client because what do I get out of it? And so you can say, well, you're going to get amazing, ma amazing engagement and social sharing and all the storytelling. And they're like, can I see it? And you've got nothing to show them. Well, what does it look like? Sorry, we've never made it before. You're just going to have to take that leap of faith with us. And um, now we have a case study. Um, and we were able to use the hashtag killer case study to bring on Lexus. So, you know, you have to make the investment at some point. And I think USA is, is very good on that innovative investment point of, you know what, our future is digital. I mean, everything we're watching these days is ones and zeros. Um, so at the end of the day, it's all moving towards digital. We've got to have a really strong network, a strong community, and strong creative and storytelling within that community if we're going to survive. Can Well, it's not, well, on air, on air. But when you think about it, it's, you know, the digital business is a completely different game. We're dealing with completely different ad agencies. Uh, in most cases, it's not the same ad agency that buys on air and that's buying digital. So we've got to basically wait until somebody buys on air, then turn around and say, well, here's the amazing digital counterpoint to it. Uh, they're going to be like, oh, well, you need to go talk to this division of Digitas, let's say. We have to go sell them in and they have to go back and forth. They've got certain brand metrics that they're holding, you know, as their measurement of success versus on air versus the client may say, hey, you know what? We love this idea. Go do it. And then we're getting hammered by a digital agency saying we need to see X, Y, Z KPIs or, or click throughs or whatever it may be. Um, it's, a, it's a really tough position to be in, and all we can keep doing is focusing on the storytelling, focusing on making sure that the fans absolutely love this, um, and continue showcasing and telling the story to advertisers. They're coming on board. I mean, what we did last year versus this year during the upfronts has been phenomenal. Um, I can't give you exact numbers, but I can say we're up probably two and a half to three X of the amount of advertisers signing up uh, during upfronts versus the year prior. Um, I just had a question on, um, do you find, um, or have you found yet, that you have show creators coming in with ideas for new shows that take this into account in the structure and story world of the story that they're constructing for the series? Have you gotten to that point yet? Are you able to get to that point? Um, yeah, I think we're getting to that point. Um, it's really tough because... Uh, you know, when we've got Jeff Easton in White Collar, um, the bread and butter for the network, of course, is the show, what's up on the big screen. Um, and as much as we have our show writers and producers that want to um, participate and play as much as they possibly can, uh, the network as a whole, um, I think that the, the universe of the convergent media area is, is starting to uh, play a role in decision making and whether or not we pick up a show, but it's like a half a percent of why we would pick up a show. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, what we're developing in the digital and the social space versus what's happening on air and advertising and what we're getting for sub fees. Um, you know, we're talking about a billion dollar business versus, you know, just breaking into, you know, multiples of millions. Um, so in the immediate future, we have to make sure that the on-air creative looks as pristine as possible and our, and our show writers and producers, that's their kind of A position. Uh, their B position is how do we then bring that world further and further out? Um, and while they are doing it, um, I don't think we're at a point where we're greenlighting a show based on whether or not we think it's going to be a social success right now, if that answers your question. Cool. Ready? Yeah. All right. I have no idea what this is going to be like, so <laughs> disclaimer. You guys did good. Watch, he's still going to um, take all the credit, though. Four clues around, <laughs> around the room. I think you guys found two of them. Um, which is just fine. I think in a lot of ways it shows sort of the, the challenges that come with 
writing a story on the fly, which is in a lot of ways what we had to do for Hashtag Killer. Um, so let me see if I can cue this up. Um, and you guys should be able to actually, if you guys have tablets or computers on you, if you search um, social samba hashtag killer story code sample, I think you should be able to find it and play it on your own. Um, let's see what we're doing here. But yes, this is the experience. Is that, can people see that? Can you see that? Yeah, probably. Can you read it more importantly? Possible? I think you need to read it out loud. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yes, the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts. Gus, you know, I've always fancied myself a song and dance man. Man clearly being the relative term. I also don't know how much singing and dancing you'll be doing in the film society. <laughs> Lies. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. It's tangled, Sean. Sir Walter Scott spelled it practice, not practice. Well, I guess speaking that it's the same, but. And so here is our first fan written into the story. This is uh, a Sean Spencerism. Ah, uh, well, social Jen and I have heard it both ways. What does that even mean? And so, the, um, so social <laughs> yeah. samba is you, it's timed. Each line, you guys can read while I talk, right? Um, it's time. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh oh. <laughs> Pacing slightly off. It means hashtag has been here, Gus. I can sense it. We'll track him down and challenge him to a duel, a gentleman's duel. The only gentleman's duel you've ever been in is a dance-off, and as I recall, you lost that battle, my friend. According to my friend's pop and lock, I delivered a flawless victory. <laughs> History must be subjective, because I've got a snake and a robot that remember it differently. Opposite, in fact. There's 12 seconds between each one. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually is, again, another challenge because people read at different speeds, and so we'd often get um, tweets from people saying it's too fast and then from other people being it's too slow, and so this is actually what we found to be the happy medium. Um, I beat you so bad that people started calling you Chris Penn before Kevin Bacon trained you, hashtag footloose. I wiped the floor with you so brutally that people started calling you Lainey Bog Boggs at prom night, hashtag she's all that. <laughs> Dulé Hill was actually in She's All That, so meta reference there. Um, <laughs> I served you so severely that people organized a DVD screening of You Got Served and dedicated all the proceeds to you. Everyone was waiting for you to step up, but you froze like a deer in the headlights as I stomped your yard. <laughs> Enough distraction, Gus. It's like pulling teeth to get you to focus. Seriously? <laughs> and... Getting there. Eek! It's horrible, Gus. Hashtag must have been lured here by the promise of an informative, and comprehensive transmedia presentation. Take a picture, Gus. I can't look. Let's hope I. Oh no, it's bad, Sean. Shield your eyes. He got Max. And that's. <laughs> it's like a bad lifetime movie. He was too young. I am. I am. <laughs> Tweeps, you've got to help us out. Maybe Hashtag left his murder weapon at the scene of the crime? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> very funny, Gus. What he meant to say is that a talented, albeit eccentric, psychic detective is on the case. Have no fear. I already know what the murder weapon was, but suggestions never hurt anyone. Did you see Acrobin109's post? A magic eight ball. It had a hashtag sticker on it and everything. <laughs> so yes, pro professional photography here. Outlook, not so good. It's not a weapon, it's an insult. He's calling me out, he's challenging me. Is my clairvoyance enough to stop him? You bet your bippy. Someone found a pair of scissors. You know, I've always wondered why scissors is plural. Is, any, is there anyone out there just using one scissor? Actually, no one found the scissors. Depressing. Well, Hashtag wasn't using scissors or even one scissor to commit his crime. Look at them. They're filthy, and it's not even blood. Okay, this just in. Fresh off the Twitter press. Murmurco discovered a stapler. 
It's red and it has a hashtag on it. Red stapler, more like red herring. It doesn't even have staples inside of it. What kind of a killer uses a stapless stapler, honestly? No one is worth our time, I can tell you that much. Wait, what's this? A vision. Chopsticks. Chopsticks covered in blood. The horror! And then... <laughs> so I take it you read someone in the second row from the top was a bad sleuth's tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Gus, how dare you? I'm in the throes of a psychic revelation. Lord, have mercy. Figures. Well, thanks for your help, Transmedia Mavens. Now we've got this murder weapon, we're headed downtown to Otemoto Sushi to make sure Hashtag doesn't claim another victim. This time he's gonna get got. You know that's right. And now we're actually done. See you. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. That was awesome. Um, and we'll uh, tweet out that URL, um, if that's cool. Maybe we'll share that. Um, so uh, I'd like to invite, so we've got a, a quick five by five uh, up next, and I'm going to go help them set up. Okay, but round of applause, guys. This is awesome. We're so excited we got to see this in action. So um, this is the second part of our, our uh, the last little part of our meetup, where we invite people who are working on projects currently and looking either for feedback or support or help or people to volunteer. And today we have a project called, and forgive me if I say this wrong, guys. Liba, love, amor. Oh, there we go. Liba, love, amor. You heard it. Um, from Alexis Mizels and Eamon Annan, is that right? Uh, Annan is our company. Oh, all right, Annan is their company. <laughs> um, presenting their project, which is in process right now. You guys all good? All right. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi, we are the core members of Anonymous Ensemble, the new generation of stage and screen. And I am Liz DeVito, actress, singer, musician, and audiovisual technician. I'm Eamon Farrell, writer, director, sometimes performer, and video audio technician. And I am Hilda, and I love each and every one of you, my dear, sweet audience. We are a 10-year-old company, and we've created dozens of multimedia, theater, live theater, interactive video, and web-based pieces. We're based here in New York City, but we frequently present work overseas in places like the UK, Australia, Germany, Greece. We've broken hearts all over the world, broken hearts in many different tongues. But don't worry, we won't break your hearts or your tongues. <laughs> the three of us mostly come from theatrical backgrounds, in case you can't tell. Uh, However, early on, we started incorporating media into our stage work in complicated ways. We usually use cameras, projectors, and real-time editing software with live video effects to create live films. And for many years, we created a web rock rev revolution called The Best, which is what you're seeing right now. It was a stage show of an anti-governmental, American Idol-esque, underground web broadcast with a transhumanist agenda that was backed by a hard rock band. We also used to broadcast the shows live on the web. We would invite both the live and remote audience members into the narratives with games, questions, and even scripted parts, like when we wrote a Skype part for a 14-year-old kid living in Arizona named Max, who would run across us randomly on the internet, I think on MySpace, it was in those <laughs> days. And we, love, we love Max very much. And we found people all across the globe and all across the world that, who became very dear to us, and we really wanted to bring them into our world. And so one of the ways we had to do that was through the screen, because they are everywhere. Uh, we're primarily interested in the live interplay between performers and audiences. Whether it's mediated or not, the best was, um, after the best, we created a show called Wonderlust, 
which was a sort of gypsy circus escapade of self-discovery in which the audience had to help us to stage the story. And in Wanderlust, Hilda was 10 feet tall, and I played a bunch of instruments, and we coaxed the audience into doing things like having a snowball fight, as you see, creating a parachute out of her skirt, and taking a warm shot of vodka from the head of a puppet. And at the end, we all save the world together. <laughs> it's true. We do. And so Wonderless was a big success when we took it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival uh, in Scotland. And the following summer, we premiered the piece in London and toured it in the UK and Norway. Since then, we've been spending a lot of time in Greece. As you see here, in Athens, we created a live rockumentary, or rock documentaire, loosely based on the Bacchae called The Return. It's a bilingual show about the intersection of Greek and American cultures and music, and it featured a bunch of amazing Greek musicians behind us there. And, uh, and a real live Greek pop star, Isaias Matiaba, and it was composed by our composer, Will Andoniou, who's a Greek-American living in Athens. <laughs> The following year, we worked with Will again and collaborated with the Greek National Opera um, to develop the first act of a new opera about the life of Alan Turing called the Turing Opera. Uh, the opera is portrayed from the perspective of a computer program, and the set was a computer screen. And we've also created a lot of other works, but our time is limited here, so we want to share our most recent endeavor, Liba Love Amor. It's all about love, darling, and it stars you. It does. Uh, we like to start any project with some sort of impossible premise, like um, Wonderless was intended to be a narrative dance party, which it wasn't exactly in the end, but it was something new. Uh, for Liba Love Amor, we started with the premise of creating a seamless film that could bring the audience members' own stories uh, into the story as a part of the overarching narrative, and that could be presented in film houses. And in the theatrical version, we use cameras and a green screen to superimpose the live action against archival footage from the works of silent film director Eric von Stroheim. And the other, audio, or the other creative seed for Leave a Love Amore was the idea of engaging in a love affair with the audience. It's a film about me <laughs> and you. It's a film about us, darling. And Liz and I voice all the other parts. Um, <laughs> It's also about us, darling. <laughs> we workshopped the piece last uh, spring at Here Art Center, and we're going to tour it this fall up and down the East Coast. But first, we're premiering it in New York City on August 31st at the New Ohio Theater in the West Village. And we're also going to have a wedding reception party after the show, so you should all come and drink. You can find out more about what we do at www.anonymousensemble.org. And the site for Leave a Level More is www.tallhilda.com. Yeah. Um, it's there remarkable. it is. Oh, I, yeah. Um, that's the site. You can come visit us there. Uh. Oh, oh yeah, I have a question I'm supposed to ask you. Um, I'm wondering, would you rather uh, love and not be loved, or be loved and not love? Did that make sense? Would you rather love and not be loved? Yeah, or... Be loved and not love. It's really hard. That's a really tough one. Yeah. Jesse. You don't actually have to answer that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Just visit, visit this site to find out more and you could answer if you want to in the <laughs> privacy of your own home and then you could come to the show and, <laughs> to and, and do the show it with everyone just else. For kicks, uh, we created an interactive conversation with Hilda and it's called to love or be loved. Uh, and as far as we can tell, it's YouTube's <laughs> first ever interactive video conversation. We launched it today, so we'll see what happens. Uh, you can find it on the homepage of tallhilda.com. And we'll also be hanging around after, so we welcome any conversation with you guys because we're also looking for any collaborations that will engage our audience and bring them into our stories the way that you guys have all been doing for years. I think Hilda wants the last word. Thank you. 
Wow, that was a five by five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, just a reminder. I was sitting off to the side. If you want to do one of those, send us an email. Five minutes at the end of every uh, meetup, we allow you to share what you're doing, and um, we schedule them a couple months in advance. So try and uh, think about that when you email us. Und now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a few final announcements. Um, uh, tomorrow we'll be announcing the September immersion. So what we're going to do there, the, the immersions are the kind of more workshop type uh, sessions we have in the uh, VIP room. Um, we're going to do a session on pitching your project. And so what we'd like to do is get a bunch of folks that actually have projects that they're about to pitch and practice in front of the group. So um, And get feedback. And get feedback. So uh, I'll post it tomorrow. Um, if you have a project and you'd like that experience, definitely sign up and let me know off, uh, just email me directly or hit me up on Twitter. Um, you want to talk about that? Uh, we have, a, we're just giving you kind of early warning, we have a, a really exciting event at the Museum of the Moving Image on October 12th. It's going to be a conversation around an exhibit that's going on there called Film After Film. Um, we have two special guests and um, it'll be a kind of an in-depth conversation about um, Film After Film. Um, and September? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then our, our uh, next forum, next September, we'll be featuring um, Saving Lincoln, which is an a interactive film about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, go figure. Uh, and um, we've got some of the folks that were doing the Mad Men uh, tweets here to kind of talk about that experience. Any Mad Men well. fans in the house? All right, so you know awesome. the woman who tweets as Betty Draper? She's coming. So we're excited. Yeah, so we're psyched. <laughs> Uh, with that, um, thanks for coming. Thanks again, Jesse and the team, uh, everyone. Uh, it was great seeing everyone. Thanks. Thanks, guys.